how fucking powerful I really am. Mm-hmm. You are, you know, each one of us is when we are like really owning, embracing all of who we are. And power for me has come from not pushing aside. It's like these pieces of, you know, I used to hate the anger, how angry I got. And now, as I started going towards that anger and being willing to like really go into the shadow aspects and really hold all that and embrace and like, no, that's part of what makes me so powerful is because I experience things fully. And so owning that, it's not bad. Like, uh, and, and I have such a better relationship with it. I get mad and I don't judge myself for getting mad. Hey there, and welcome back to another episode of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I am super pumped today because I'm talking with the loving lion, my brother, Rick Evans. I met Rick, let's see, it was uh, less than a year ago. It feels like close to a year, but it's probably more like actually six months or something like that, even less than that. But just immediately soul brothers, and we've had um, some awesome connections through the medicine space. And I've invited Rick on the podcast, one, to get to know you a little bit more, Rick, and also because because I know there's got to be a story behind the loving lion, because that is your handle on social media, and you truly are the loving lion. So with that, Rick, welcome to the pod. Hey, thanks, Sam. I'm excited to be here. Thanks, brother. Yeah. So if you could just give the listeners a quick little overview of what's present for you these days in terms of what's present in your life, you know, um, you can mention how you're an entrepreneur, but outside of just being a business owner, what's really present with you? You're recently engaged. That might be one thing, right? <laughs> yeah, man. Honestly, my I, I am experiencing more joy and love and gratitude than I ever have in my entire life. You know, I'm 49 years old. I feel like, um, I feel like my, my, I really started hitting my stride at 40 in terms of just my own personal growth. And my journey has been from the simple way to say it is from self-loathing to self-love and stepping into deeper and more full levels of really loving who I am, embracing all of me. And through that, being able to give my gifts to the world. And, you know, I had a really, I mean, so I've, I've got two kids. I've got a, a 12 and a 10 year old, 12 year old boy, a 10 year old girl. And I mean, they're what I'm most grateful for in my life are my, my kids and, and uh, incredible relationship with them. They're with me, you know, about half of the time. I have a great relationship with their mom though, and my, my ex. And, and so, yeah, my kids and Stephanie, my fiance, we met about two and a half years ago. I feel like I called in like my person and that was after a really rough, this wasn't my marriage, but in between about a four year relationship, it was, man, it was really, it was like trying to force something to work. that was never really the right, it was never right for either of us. And, it, and, you know, there was a lot of pain and betrayal and all that kind of stuff that, that happened. And so I had all this story around that and a lot, yeah, it's a lot of work to overcome really to be able to allow myself to fully love another person and to trust to bookmark that. I mean, that's been a big piece of my life. It's been, um, this idea of having to protect myself and always like looking out the other, you know, behind my, you know, out the other eye kind of thing and see, you know, trying to pick, you know, jealousy and all that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, I'm in a much better place. I feel like I'm finally, finally um, coming to a point of being able to relax in my relationship and feeling safe. I love that, brother. Thank you so much for sharing that. And there's a few things there definitely to unpack. And the first thing of which is um, from self-loathing to self-love. And when you said that, that just lit my body up with spirit chills. So I know there's something there to for us to explore more. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about um, the self-loathing part? Yeah. I mean, I guess I got to kind of go back a little bit to, to tell the story of that. And, and- it, 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 it's, I mean, I had an air of confidence about me, but it was a show and it wasn't from as early as I can remember. I had this feeling that if you really and truly knew me, if you knew who I really was. If you knew me, you, you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't love me. You wouldn't want to be having, you know, that I wasn't okay. Inherently something, there was inherently something wrong with me. And um, Is this as a kid, uh, like I all the way back. From, yeah. From it, from even as a kid, I, as a kid, you know, I was, 
always like kind of, I remember having lots of just fear of death and a lot of kind of, you know, just dark thoughts as a kid and just scary. You know, I, I was very insecure. We moved, my dad was in the air force, super like military colonel in the, and his dad was a general. And I mean, so military, wow. we lived on ba- on it, on bases all the time, you know, where they play the, you know, you stop at like five fifteen and have to, you know, stand at attention for the, the star spangled, spangled banner and all this kind of stuff. And I was so not into that. I was such a, re- I was the rebel kid. I would get in trouble. I was vandalizing. I was getting all kinds of trouble, you know, mostly nothing like too, too serious, but just, you know, toilet paper in houses and, you know, and knocking and running, egg and just all, whatever. And not making you know, uh, uh, your father and your grandpa uh, proud. And other oh, words. man, I was always running from the MPs, the, the military police, you know, hopping the fence and getting chased and, so that's like my early kind of early preteens, you know, and then by, I think right around eighth grade, I discovered alcohol and I drank like an alcoholic from the very first where I would just chug as much as I could on my dad's liquor cabinet or drink wine coolers and stand on my head and just, you know, let it go to my head. I would drink till I passed out and, and blackout drunk. And, and, and that happened regularly all through junior high, high school. And everything I did was absolutely like, I just was trying to escape and we would move. I went to three high schools and I was always the new kid. So that became my identity was I was the party guy, you know, and I was, you know, always the new kid. And a lot of times in small towns where everybody knew each other. And so this insecurity and I thought I was ugly and I, I, you know, I just, girls didn't like me. And, you know, as I, as I look back was like, no, they really did. And I wasn't, you know, but I was a scrawny kid to start with, you know, I was really skinny and um, I was not, I was, on the shorter side and things like that. And so just had all these insecurities. And, and so I, it was just drugs and alcohol, like to excess. And I was a good kid. Like I never did anything. I never wanted to hurt anybody. And I always had a lot of remorse. And so I think that started that cycle of the self-loathing of, of the way I hurt my parents and, you know, I heard, and people that cared about me. I, my girlfriend, my senior year was valedictorian. I was I was, you know, really into her. She was a really good girl. Didn't get any trouble. I was the opposite. Got in a, I almost killed her in a car wreck like a week before graduation, you know, so she was up there on crutches. And, and you know, I had two DUIs by the time I was 19. I was kicked off uh, the Air Force Base. I couldn't live at home my senior, halfway through my senior year. I was thrown into treatment. I just was always in and out of trouble. And I always felt bad about it. And I wasn't going to do it again. And I was so sad at the people that I heard and, and I, and my, you know, and I remember hearing, you know, one of the really visceral memories, actually, this wasn't even, this is kind of pre-drinking, but it's my dad. I, it, it's, it's me, uh, when I was I think eighth grade and, uh, gotten a, we were vandalizing after school. I was in the gifted and talented and we were, you know, we had a pizza party. And so me and my friend afterwards wanted to van, we vandalized the cafeteria we were smashing watermelons and doing all this stuff. And I took a crap on the tray in the cafeteria and set in line thinking that, you know, <laughs> it would be, I mean, it was funny at the time, you know, it was just like, who could want right. to yeah. out? And I got in trouble for it. And I remember I, I had to see a psychiatrist at the time as eighth grade. And my dad was like, what's wrong with you? I, something's wrong with you, son. That's not normal. And I still like, I, I feel that, you know, and that, I think that it, it's those stories that we take on that, you know, that people tell us or, and then we tell ourselves. And then, and, and, and so that was my story for so long that there's something wrong with me. My anger, I would get, you know, I mean, just go to rage, you know, and, and just so quick to anger. And I judged myself so much for it. It just wasn't right. And it wasn't safe for other people. I, I used to punch walls all the time till my knuckles were bloody and, and uh, I just didn't know what to do with it. And, And so it was always like, control the anger, control the anger, just stifle it. Don't be that way. It's always jealous, always afraid of girlfriends cheating on me. And they did, you know, and I had those things happen. And and then they just built that same story that something's inherently wrong with me. And so, you know, I guess you talk about the core wound, I guess that's kind of mine. And I kind of catch up to now, like I, at age 19, I, I got a second DUI and I ran from the cops and was in all this trouble. I remember the, you know, running from the cops and, and, and actually just the sense of like, Oh my God, I can't do this anymore. Like and I stopped and I let him get me. And I had to call my dad from jail and he actually thought I was sober. I was, for, 
I'd gone through treatment, tried to try to stay sober and was from, when went, went to a year at college and I went through uh, attorney system and all that, but I was, I was trying to go through AA and be sober and uh, it didn't last, but I didn't tell my parents. And so I would get calls from them. Congratulations on your 30 day, day sober, your 90 day sober, your six month, your one year. And it was all a lie. And so that just further, just that shame and guilt, just the deep shame. And um, yeah, so I just carried that on. I, I got sober at age 19 and really just went all in on the AA program and everything for about six years. And, um, and that was what I needed at the time. And it was great. And, and, um, you know, it, it, it definitely helped me and it just got me to where I could survive because I was definitely headed, headed for like, you know, I wasn't going to last long at the rate I was going. And yeah, um, to get kind of caught up to now, I guess I, I mean, I've done a lot of just, I've always been searching. I've read so many self-help books from before they were even popular, you know, and, and, uh, but I, um, moved to sand, moving around a lot. I moved to Sandpoint with my wife at the time and we were pregnant. Sandpoint, so about, Idaho. Yeah. To Sandpoint, Idaho, where I oh, live now. That was about thir- 13 years ago. Where'd you move from? I was in Santa Barbara, actually, most before that. Five years in Santa Barbara. And then I'd been in Charleston, South Carolina, and I'd been in Maui. Um, so still moved well, around places a lot. where you could party and rage and, you know, totally. have a lot yeah. Of fun. <laughs> yeah. Totally. And, and in my marriage, you know, I was not, I wasn't the person that I know I am. Mm-hmm. I also, so I wasn't, again, I wasn't in alignment with like who I really know I am deep down now. And, and, uh, yeah. So with AA at 19 and uh, going through the program for six years or so, it sounds like that's kind of when the foundation started. Um, I have a similar story. I had uh, my DUI at 22. And um, right before that, I was pledging Sigma Chi or I was in Sigma Chi at party school and um, was going down a bad path. And then the DUI is really what laid the foundation for, you know, for me to get my shit together, if you will. Um, and what I'm interested for you is at what point would you say you found like spirituality? Yeah, I I think I found it. Um, I found it through, through AA for sure. I think, um, and I, I wasn't like, you know, I was introduced to it. I went to Sunday school a little bit in church. We were Protestant, not nothing like too serious. My dad had been Catholic, but we weren't raised like super strict church, but we were, it was part of our life. We baptized and all that. So I didn't have any like really like big hangups about it or anything. And, and yeah, I, um, it kind of, the belief system was, you know, God is whatever I, however I can believe. So that was a nice like way to open that up and wasn't a specific like God of the old Testament or anything that I had to believe in. And, uh, but it was, it was really like a basis of I'm completely powerless on my own and I need help from outside. So it's a little different than I understand than my current belief system. Right. Or, now where we are all one, I am love, I am God, we are all, you know, uh, but, but, well, but that was the start of it for sure. Well, well let's pause there. Cause that's a really good point in religion. You're kind of looking outside of yourself. Whereas with spirituality, you are encouraged to look within. Yeah. It's such yeah. a shift. It's from this fundamental, like I am weak and I need a power outside of myself because I'm hopeless without myself, without, without it. And, and to where the power, you know, I guess it's so sometimes hard to put into words, but this, there's this source is everywhere and it's in me. And there's a, there's this, you know, there's a vibration and there's a experience of that. And, and just the realize, realizing how much, you know, how fucking powerful I really am. Mm -hmm. You are, you know, each one of us is when we're, when we are like really owning, embracing all of who we are and, and the power for me, has come from not pushing aside. It's like these pieces of, you know, I used to hate the anger, how angry I got. And now it's like, as I started going towards that anger and being willing to like really go into the shadow aspects and really hold all that and embrace and like, no, that's part of what makes me so powerful is because I experience things fully. And so owning that, it's not bad. Like, uh, and, and I have such a better relationship with it. I get mad and I don't judge myself for getting mad. You like, you know, it's like, this is part of who I am. And I'm, I, I, I allow myself to feel and experience things. And, and I also have like a, 
you know, I'm not punching walls either. You know, it's pretty rare. That's kind of, and then I might, you know, having a punching bag is something I actually want to get, but like it's, it's contained, you know, and contains not even the right word. It's just, it's, it allow myself to express it safely. Mm. I think where it doesn't have to hurt anybody else. And, and, uh, so embracing all those parts have been a really big piece of my, uh, my journey, even the jealousy, you know, realizing that that's just a part of me that's just trying to keep me safe, you know? And, and it used to be like, God, what the fuck's wrong with me? Why, why am I so insecure? Why am I so jealous? And just all that negative self-talk around it. And, you know, and even with, and we've talked about, you know, I had issues through my life of, you know, erectile dysfunction, basically, or just, and I don't even know if that's the right word. A lot of times it was more just the, inner, the fear of it, the fear of not being able to perform right. and not being present in the moment and those experiences or not really being connected to them. And, and I, I realize that's part of who I really am is, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I live my life from a place of my heart. And, uh, if I'm not like connected to a woman, then sex is meaningless, you know, really. And I, and it's like, that wasn't what I wanted it to be like, cause it was cool to have sex, you know, <laughs> when yeah. you're or whatever twenties, it's like, no, that, that totally relates, you know, with, um, my most recent ex, it, it was that similar type of thing where <laughs> towards the end of the relationship, you know, for lack of a better way to put it you know, she, she wanted to fuck and I want to, you know, have that in deeper relationship at that point. And it just, um, it caused a dissonance that I didn't, I wasn't aware of, you know, and this is part of the programming of our society. Everything you're talking about when it, it whether it's, um, sex and performance or it's jealousy, which is a part of that too. You know, there's so many distractions we have and you, we can look anywhere from the programming on television to sports. You know, I know you're an athlete and you're an athletic guy. And um, I used to love watching sports. And part of what I gave up in spirituality is watching sports. Because if you really think about it, like we start to feel good based off of other people's successes and we get depressed when they lose. And that has nothing to do with us. We yeah. can cheer as much as we want, but why are we taking pride in that? Anyways, like, no, I understand it. But just for me, I think part of what we need to do to get over these things is to find places where we can remove the distractions. And at least for me, that was a major distraction. And I'm wondering, you might have already said it, but when it comes to jealousy and these type of things that we're talking about, were there any um, pivotal things that you had to let go of? Yeah. I mean, um, I definitely had these, I mean, I, I can, you mean in terms of like memories and things that happen and stuff or like, well, I know you, um, are really involved with your men's group. I think you've been your men's group yeah. for what, like 10, 10 years or so. 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in terms of what's happened to get me through that. Yeah. That's yeah. Cause like when you start to put more time into self-development, I mean, I call what we're talking about soul development rather than self-development, you know, like we're the spiritual development. Yeah, yeah. And when you put more time into it, you need to find, areas of your life to let go of things to afford to make that time. So were there things that you had to like, let go of? Yeah. So we had moved to, to Sandpoint and my marriage was, we were having our first baby, but things, you know, we just, we, we were growing apart. I wasn't, I wasn't loyal and you know, it, it yeah. And so there's, so I, I was in a, and we started, my brother and I started a business, Evans Brothers Coffee. And, and uh, it was basically I moved here around 2008 and the economy crashed. I, I'd been doing real estate and then I just, you know, everything. I had properties and I had rental properties and every, I lost everything and went to, to zero and uh, even below zero. And uh, somehow we managed to get a loan and we started this, this coffee roasting business. But it was a scary time because I had no money. You know, I, I, had been pretty comfortable in Santa Barbara doing real estate and stuff. And man, in Sandpoint, we're just broke now at this point and starting this business, we've got a baby being born and my marriage is on the rocks and, you know, 
we had our second child two years later and we divorced like right after that basically. And that's about the time that I joined a uh, men's group. And yeah, things were dark for me at that point in time. I did not like who I was. I felt responsible for my marriage ending. I had these two kids and I, it was devastating to me to have young kids that I wasn't going to, that weren't going to be able to live in the same house. I didn't, I mean, it wasn't what I wanted. It wasn't, you know, and I didn't see how, and, and now looking back, it's, it's, we've done a beautiful job with our kids and raised them together. And, and it's, it's, it's so different than I ever imagined it could have been, but yeah, it was rough. And the men's group, what, what, what really the big shift in how I was with myself was, was stopping stiff arming all the stuff that I didn't want and pushing it away and allowing myself to actually feel that jealousy, feel that insecurity, feel that anger with the support of my brothers, you know, and then go into it and just really go into it fully and then find that little spark of hope and courage. And so it was not long after that, you know, everybody always had their kind of animal names and men's group and everything. And, and I, I didn't know what mine was. And, and, uh, I remember having, uh, it was coming out of, a yeah, it's just a really, really down. I was, it was rough. I, and I would spin my brain. I would just go off on these tangents. My mind would just take me in these terrible places all the time. I didn't know what to do about it. And, but there was, there was a, a moment I had been crying and I've been trying to meditate. And then somehow I, I had, I don't know what triggered it or when it came, but I had this vision and it was like, and I maybe I think there was a little song I was hearing. And I had this vision that came to me of this lion, like looking out over a cliff with his chest up and it's just, just proud. And he had like his lion cubs behind him. And he just was just like, I just, it's just the image of, of just power and courage. And it's like something inside of me, like I, I tapped into this piece inside of me that the heart that I couldn't always find with all the thoughts and all this fear that was, that was kind of covering it up. And it was just like, you're there. Like, this is it. This is me. This is me. And I just, I knew that I was always felt so much passion and love and, and I, it just, the name just came to me, loving lion. This is, and, and I came out of that. And I remember sharing with my group and it was just this image that I just, I feel it now. And it just gives me this like reminder of who I really am. And it's a man that is powerful, courageous, very vulnerable. And I allow my emotions and I don't know if that's a lion or not, but it feels like it is to me. It's just like, you know, loving lion. And so, yeah, I have a, I have a tattoo, I have a necklace, I, I have, <laughs> and I think I've just, li I've just grown into that even more to where it just, it's, 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 it really is who I am now. And people know me that way. And um, yeah, I have my Instagram at loving lion Rick. And so that, that part of starting to, you know, and it's starting to just really embrace who I really am and know that all those pieces, the, the anger, the jealousy, the fear, like that's all a part of what makes me able to connect with other people. And the fact that I've come from where I have and, and where I am now, like I wouldn't be who I am now without the, I guess, the journey that I've gone through. And, and it's not like I had a rough life per se. Like, I mean, we moved around a lot, but, you know, I, my parents loved me. I don't have like any specific reason why I can think that I was a, a, an alcoholic and all that, but yeah, it wasn't, it hasn't been an easy road for me internally. And so that's where I feel so much joy of where I'm, I'm able to experience more and more of this now in my life. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of think of it as these things have to happen. We need to have these soul contracts with these other humans. Um, yeah so that it kind of gets us on a path that helps us along the way. And oftentimes it's going to be chaos. It's going to be things that we will label as chaos or negative and all this type of stuff to bring us back to the light, you know? Yeah, for sure. You know, the other thing about that's been big. So the men's group was a lot of that was going into the feelings and just really being in my body and, 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 you know, a lot of shadow work and, the later evolution of men's work has gotten a lot more into creation. So going into the you work and go, you know, looking at all my stuff, but then 
I didn't really start to make the big shifts until I also was, you know, I Abraham Hicks, for example, like that's been huge for me and, you know, law of traction and just creation. I work with, um, I still have a coach. I talk to once a week, Leslie Bellelli is her name and she's like a happiness coach and she's uh, incredible. I, you know, went through a whole course that she did a six months, four month course and, and just cultivating happiness on purpose, you know, and, and happiness isn't always smiling. It's including all of it, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's not resisting. It's allowing all the experience of my humanness. And, and so, and, and examining the stories that I've been telling myself for years and years. And even when I first got in a relationship with Stephanie, I would talk all about how much my last, I was hurt in my last relationship. And it was just like, one day it was like, you know, when are you going to stop telling that freaking story? Like, mm. and until I stopped, being willing to tell that and willing to tell another story, I didn't really start to shift like in a profound way, I don't think. And so that, that part of it has been, and to know that I have the ability to get myself back to center, no matter what, like no matter what happens and no matter what have other people, what energy they have and what they're, you know, my brother can be all pissed off and worked up about the business and I don't have to go there with them. Like I can hear them and I can still have the ability to, be in okay in myself and, and be right. in good place. And that's such a gift. And that's been a, a lot of, that's been a long road <laughs> and it's not done, but. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so with stories, you know, I mean, again, that's part of the, our programming to get this, uh, get us in this, um, fear state of mind or victim mentality, whatever it might be of these totally. negative stories. What advice would you have for someone that's listening to this and being like, Oh man, I've been caught in this loop that I've been trying to get out of this story. Like how would you suggest someone might be able to let go of that story? Mm, yeah. I think my process anyway, has been becoming aware of the story, first of all, you know, and, and then like, Oh, how am I feeling when I say it, when I, when I, when I share this story, you know, when I tell this story, what's this actually like just noticing what goes on when I, when I continue to tell it and, um, realizing that there's something that it gives me or I wouldn't keep saying it. And it, maybe it gives me a sense of like, I can be a victim and then I don't have to, it's easier sometimes to be a victim. Like, yeah. I, definitely that victim was a big, big part of who I was like big part of it. And um, yeah, it's just like the easier way in a way, cause I, I'm not responsible if I'm a victim. Right. And so go from that point of it, it, it really comes down to a decision. Like, who do I want to be? Like, who do I want to be? Who do I really want to be? And, um, and then just stepping in that direction, man. And like so many times it's like, for me, it's, I was, I was tormented in my last relationship. She left me for somebody else. I, it was on the side, the whole bit. Um, it was somebody that was like her boss and I was, he was a friend of mine. He had actually been in men's group with me and you know, all this kind of stuff. And I was just, I would see them together and it was just like, I couldn't deal with it. And, and, um, but and then it, I don't know why I'm even bringing that up, but it's, it, it's this choice over and over of, okay, do I want to go in the direction of love or fear? And, and mm. I just keep stepping in. And, and a mean, lot of times it's been, what would love do right here? What would love do? That makes it so easy. <laughs> do I want to go in the direction of love or fear? What would love do? That yeah. makes it so easy. One thing I often tell people when they're going through hard times is what, what's helped me is um, the highest formula by Bashar. Are you familiar with Bashar? I've heard of Bashar, but no, I don't know. The, so check it out. For sure. Yeah. So Bashar, his human name is Daryl Anka. Daryl Anka um, channels an entity, a future version of himself, I believe, um, that he calls Bashar. So he's known as Bashar. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's cool stuff. There's a documentary for him actually, now that you mention it, I, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It, so in his channelings, he talks about the highest, or what does he call it? The, the formula. And it's all about, it's this page long document. You could Google uh, the formula Bashar and it will come up and it's a page long, but basically all it is, is in any situation you have a choice. And the answer is to follow your highest excitement. Now, obviously, mm -hmm. say you don't want to go work and that's not your highest excitement. There's certain times when we have obligations, right? But for the most 
most part, if we can start to look at, as you put it, Rick, is this going to bring me fear or love? Is yeah, that yeah. the way you say it? Yeah. Or do I want to choose love or fear? Yeah. Right. Do I want to choose love or fear? I mean, it can be these simple little mindset shifts where we give ourselves, uh, where it starts, as you put it, um, it starts with having the awareness, you know, yeah, it yeah. really does. So I love that. And speaking of awareness, you mentioned, um, Abraham Hicks and the law of attraction. Now I know you've been working with five MEO DMT, Bufo Alvarius and all that, <laughs> So, which I call it the few things, the manifestation mess and infinity mess and all that type of stuff. But I'm curious because I've noticed the more that I work with Bufo, how things start to manifest. And I need to be very careful of my thoughts because if I am having a negative thought, then it's going to manifest into reality. How have you been able to couple your experience with the law of attraction with your integration of working with Bufo? Well, I, I man, I, the work with Bufo, I am the access to the vortex <laughs> as Abraham talks about and to that vibration of the, of source of divine consciousness is seems so much more accessible than it ever was for me. Um, and so there's a level of, Oh, this is a greater level of trust in, you know, in the universe that it is here to serve me. And, um, oftentimes in my life, I've had this fear that something's going to happen bad. And, and, um, I wouldn't say that's t entirely gone, but it's definitely, it's definitely shifted quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the medicine, toad medicine has been such a gift. All the work that I, I think I've done in terms of like moving towards level, greater levels of self-love. I think that this just took it to a place that I had never quite been able to go. Um, yeah. The feeling of absolute, complete and total love and embracing of everything about me. Uh, man, <laughs> as I just think about it, I can just feel that. And, and it's so sweet. And it's so what I wanted, it's what I've been looking for from the earliest memory. And I didn't know that's what I looked, was looking for at one point, but it, it's, it felt like the greatest relief of, of, of a lifetime to actually feel completely, totally held, loved and embraced, you know? And so, yeah, I just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm able to live in, 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 you know, we talked about how it creates this, uh, um, kind of a reset, you know, and, and so all these neuro nets, these patterns that have been more difficult for me to shake and everything like I, I, I'm, I have more space around those and I feel like I'm able to create the, the, the patterns that serve me, you know, and, and it's such an awesome opportunity. I mean, it's, I, you know, I, I would love to say I, if I would have discovered it 20 years ago, I probably could have saved myself a bit of uh heartache. Cause I don't know that all the pain and suffering is necessarily always necessary. You know, there's maybe more than one path to the same place. I think that probably some of it was, and I, I think that it's helped me to, it, it allows me to be a person that can connect with other people because I've got those stories. I shared humanity, you know, if I would have skipped over all that, then I, I'd have a lot harder time connecting with people, I think. So that, that's the beauty in the, in that history. But yeah, man, I could go on and on about that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's, it is truly such an amazing medicine. Like you said, it can be very blissful for some people, for most people, but uh, it can also be some shadow work. You know, we don't often equate 5-MeO DMT to a shadow work medicine as we would say ayahuasca where right. we're going deep. But the thing about Bufo is it can it can bring up these things that we buried uh, just like ayahuasca. But the difference is it's not heady with ayahuasca. It's mm -hmm. very heady. And if you can surrender to it, it's going to be some tough lessons a lot of the times. Right. And, yeah. but you're going to get through it if you can surrender to it. And most of us as humans, we're, we're cerebral, we're analytical. We like the heady because it makes sense. 
with Bufo, we're left with a feeling and just like, what the fuck just happened? And, <laughs> you know, it can be great when we get to that blissful uh, state for someone like me that is so like obsessed with like the idea of if God created us, then who created God and getting the answer to that. But it's a felt experience and not known experience in terms of understanding from an analytical point of view, it can drive you a little crazy. <laughs> and for other people, you know, the experiencing traumas that you might not realize that you're processing because it's not so slow in holding your hand of showing you what's going on. Integration is extremely important to start to piece it all back together. And I know for me, I love doing breath work. I think you and I might have mentioned that is breath work something you do in your practice. You know what? I've just a little bit. I'm uh, Stephanie has done a lot of that as you know. And so, yeah, I want to cultivate more of it. I, honestly, I haven't done a lot, but yeah. I have. It's really powerful. It's so powerful. I just did breath work with some local facilitators um, a few days ago, and I, it was basically a bufo reactivation. I mean, I got to that place of just dissolution, and it was. It's so interesting because I'm finding this more and more when something extremely. I'm just going to call it spiritual happens. And I have like the awareness of, oh, this is happening. And, you know, like I'm not in my body right now, or just like the it, all of a sudden snapping into that bufo space in breath work. Yeah. I'll, I'll have that awareness. And then as soon as I try to embrace it, it's gone. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of weird. But yeah. as soon as anyway. you have consciousness of it, you're like, think about it, your mind gets there and it takes you out a little. Yeah, it's almost like the whole grasping thing, you know, you go a grasp for it and that is the lesson. That's the medicine in itself to, you know, have that detachment to it and not try to grasp at it. But go on, it, label it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, labeling yeah. things, right? Um, so what types of integration practices do you like to do? What, what I'm doing, um, kind of the key things for me are before my feet hit the floor in the morning, I'm cultivating this this feeling of gratitude and joy. And, um, um, most of the time I'm, uh, a lot of times I'll, you know, it could take the form of a meditation or it might just be simply just thinking about things that are, that I'm really grateful for. I think about my kids, my partner, you know, until I'm really feeling it. And so I'm getting out of bed. I'm feeling that a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll listen to some uh, different meditations or I'll do my own thing. But I try to, I generally meditate most days. Uh, at least I'm in the, I'm on a good path of it right now. Um, and through the day and then the same thing at night, like the last thing before I close my eyes, I want to be in gratitude mm. and, and feeling love. And, um, so those two things, and that helps me have more likelihood of waking up that way as well. Um, and then through the day I'm finding times to slow down to really just be, you know, kind of like that movie soul, you know, yeah, um, and just, you know, where you could just, Oh my gosh, the beauty of watching kids playing or whether the, you know, any kids or the birds watching the leaves and the trees, feeling the air. I mean, yesterday I was able to go down and lay, I lay in the Creek. I live right by the, we live right by the deep water Creek here. And, and this little, you know, there's a little shallow part on the edge. I just lay there. My whole body is covered by water and my head's out of the water on the chair. And I just laid there for like an hour and meditated, just felt the water on my skin. It was absolutely perfect temperature, feeling just the joy of creation. And so, man, I'm finding as many of those times as I can through the day. The other thing that's really cool that, you know, the Bufo has helped really make alive. Also something called a uh, thing I did a few, I was introduced to Aletheia, which is like authentic relating, circling. You know, it's like really being with the other person. So this was another practice that, that's been really, really powerful for me. Um, and uh, it's really being present with other people, you know, and I have come not in my business, you know, I can go by the, the, the roastery and I'll the cafe. And I see people, I'll, I'll, I see people everywhere I go. I see people I know. And there's so many beautiful people in this community. And so a lot of times I used to kind of like be in a hurry and I had too many things to do and I didn't, would like look the other way. If I saw, didn't, I saw him in the grocery store, I didn't want to take the time. And I, I'm rarely doing that. Now I'm very much taking those moments and 
having a connection and it might only be a minute or two, but like really being with that person. And I just feel so much joy in all these connections I get to have. And so that feels like integration, you know? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that totally is, I I love the simplicity of something like that, you know, and it's, it's simple in theory, but it's so much, so much bigger than that in terms of the practice, right? Cause that is the connection and looking people in their eyes, you know, things like that. Not saying to look at people in their eyes right after you do Bufo, of course. Um, that's <laughs> something I would probably stay away from for a few days. But I did want to talk with you because uh, you mentioned the creek. And I was hoping you would mention the creek. And there's just something about the water. There's something about the element of the water that is... I can't put words to it, but do you have that sort of relationship with the element? Absolutely, man. Yeah, I am a Pisces and and uh, if that has anything to do with it, but I've always been drawn to the water, the ocean. I had fish tanks all over the house when I was a kid and wanted to be a marine biologist. I was fascinated with it. I didn't do that because I thought it was too much schooling, <laughs> yeah. too much science or something. I don't know. But yeah, the water, the the ocean, I mean, in particular, is so special to me. And I lived at the ocean for a long time before moving to Sandpoint. Um, we don't have an ocean, but we have a giant lake and we have creeks and rivers all around. And it's and we also have skiing, which I love. So I get the, 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 the frozen snow up there, too. And for my homies in California that are just anywhere in the world that um, haven't been to Idaho, Sandpoint, Idaho, it's amazing. I was recently there visiting uh, Rick and all your homies out there. And it reminds me of South Lake Tahoe. Like that, that yeah. area is gorgeous. It's beautiful. That lake there is remind me of Tahoe. And then you got the mountains right there, as you said, to ski and snowboard and do all that. So it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And I, yeah, so I love the water. I mean, I walk right down. It's about a hundred yards from the, the creek and there's a bridge you can jump off about 15, 20 foot bridge or something. And into a Creek. Yeah. Into a Creek. Yeah. It's a, it's more of a river. It's a, it's a pretty wide Creek yeah. you know? yeah, yeah. points. It's and uh, yeah, it's deep. You can swim. So I take the paddle boards down there and stuff and it's, it's awesome. Sweet. It. Well, cool. Uh, there's a couple more things I want to ask you about. One is you mentioned calling in Stephanie and you basically are saying you manifested her. So I'd love to hear any, um, yeah. tips and tricks you have in towards uh manifestation well i guess the way i've been taught is to you know visualizing but it's more of it's less of the actual image and more of getting into the feeling and so you know my my coach that uh, would work with me on this was you know and i felt like after my last relationship then i was single for i guess a couple years and you know sandpoint's a small town and i was like there was i just I knew everybody already. Like I wasn't meeting yeah. new, new women and, um, and I, and, and those I would, I just, I wanted to feel excited about somebody and I just wasn't getting there. And it was a little bit, you know, scary because I didn't want to be alone. And that's, you know, probably one of the big fears a lot of us have and certainly me, but yeah. And so I would spend time feeling into what it will feel like to have this beautiful woman with me that, wants to share and the, you know, doing the things I like to do that like a lot of my relationships in the past were kind of had different friend groups and we didn't like to do a lot of the same things. And it was just like, I had this separate life. I'd go out with my friends, you know, I'd love to go dancing and she didn't want to do that. And, and so I, I wanted that. Like, I wanted somebody that could share and I wanted somebody that, yeah, I didn't realize how, you know, I mean, Stephanie's, she's perfect for me. I mean, we're both like, she, she, I'm a pretty like color. I'm a very colorful and kind of flashy kind of person. And, you know, I like, and she like loves the hell out of that and, and just encourages me to be fully me and express myself and in, in all the ways I want to express myself. And that's something that I didn't always have. And so I really appreciate it. And that that's, yeah, it was really just continuing to come back to that space in my, you know, it works often for me, like at the end of a meditation, Mm-hmm. That's a perfect time for me to get into that visualization space of just feeling what it's like. Right now, we're feeling what it's like to get in the house that we, because we're looking at buying a house and everything. And we'd love to have something on water. And, and so just yeah. the feeling of what that, without getting too attached to specifically where it is, you know, just that, how that's going to feel and, and coming home to our place together and the kids having their friends playing and jumping in the water. And 
so getting that and just letting that build and, and then trusting trusting in source you know yeah let, let go yeah <laughs> yeah let it go it's awesome. No, I love that. Thank you for sharing. And congratulations on Scorn and Stephanie and your recent engagements as superstars for you guys. Yeah. You did mention Evan uh, Evans Brothers Coffee, your business, a couple times just briefly. And one thing um, that I've been dancing with recently is this idea of ritualizing your business. I have another podcast called Clone Yourself where we talk all business stuff. And I recently had a guest on where she talks, she spoke on how to weave spirituality into your business. Mm -hmm. And one thing I've been noticing recently is I've only been into spirituality for a couple of years now. I'm pretty fresh actually. And I was so hardcore in 3d in terms of like writing down my goals and like a organization and tasks and uh, how I was going to execute everything. And I've gone such the other way where it's been like too much of a pendulum swing in the feminine and flow and uh -huh. where now I'm finding like kind of this happy medium in actually taking goals but they're not goals how i did them before they're kind of more intentions and then using them in prayer with my guides and manifestation and what i've noticed is it's kind of fast tracking the rate at which it manifests into reality because there's more intentionality around it along yeah. with you know the support system right so i'm curious with you if there's any ways in your business you've been able to weave spirituality into business yeah I, I um i feel like my um you know who i am and and, and my you know i you know my calling is to i said in a kind of different ways but to shine my light and dance with the world <laughs> you know and i can do that we we you know we with our we have several cafes and um we have you know our our place here in sandpoint is really like kind of a hub of the community and we've just created a really special place there. And we were very much involved in like, we're partnering with nonprofits all the time. We're always doing things to give back. Um, I feel like I'm able to give my gifts in, just in our employees. We've got about 30 something people working for us. And, and um, I, you know, being just really connected with each one of them as individuals and helping them to just to focusing on how can they thrive. And it's whether they stay with us for six months, six years, whatever it is, you know, and if it's in, in, in people that have kind of stepped into their own businesses that had worked with us and they come back and they pick our brains and they, and we, I mean, I love being able to coach people in those ways and help nice. them live into their own dreams. And um, so with our employees and just customers, I, I get reflected all the time on how much we're appreciated in, in this community and, and how we add value. And we, we post a ton of events. We've thrown some really great parties over the years I get a ton of joy out of that, like hosting a, an event and just seeing people having fun and, and just having a place for people to come and connect. And, you know, there's a lot of special experiences that happen like in our, in our space. Um, we host men's group there for one, we've hosted like, uh, you know, authentic games nights and things like that. So very much like have been able to integrate, uh, the spiritual aspect of, you know, of spirit into our business. And the more I'm, connected to that. And I'm like, how can I give my gifts in my business life today? Mm -hmm. the more things go well and the money sink takes care of itself. You know, if I'm, if I'm taking care of our, our people and really caring and just tr trying to create a really awesome experience for our customers, you know, the best product and the best service. So they feel special when they come through the door. Like it's just all those little things that add up to a fulfilled sense of purpose in my business. Absolutely. No, I love, um, I love all that. And, you know, a lot of it speaks to me, especially empowering your employees and coaching them up and really like what they want to do. I think that's amazing. It's so cool. And just from my point of view, just being in Sandpoint, not even that long, you know, I could see that Evans Brothers is a big part of the community. One, from talking with you and hearing about it, but then two, also going to the grocery store and then seeing your coffee <laughs> right there. <laughs> yeah. um, it was like, you know, in the, I don't know what's called, but like the fresh grounds or whatever, not yeah. just that you had bags in the store. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Next time you'll have to make it over to the, to the roastery. 
Oh, <laughs> definitely. Definitely. You will. But yeah, no, that's awesome. And yeah, guys check out uh, Rick's coffee company, Evans brothers. Um, I got a huge brand crush on, I think the brand is absolutely <laughs> the art's cool and the coffee tastes great. So you can't go wrong. That's awesome. Yeah, man. So let's see, we've talked about quite a bit, try to keep these around this time frame, And I'm sure there's plenty afterwards. I'm going to be like, Oh man, I could have asked you about this could have asked you about that. But I think the biggest thing when it comes down to it for me with this podcast, soul seeker is it's all about soul life balance rather than work life balance, you know, to reframe that work is a component of life so that we start to not put so much attention into our businesses and working because we didn't come to earth to just work away. And you've already mentioned quite a lot of things you do uh, in terms of soul life balance. You know, I I can see your spiritual practices through things you've uh, mentioned and then some of the things you do with your life. But um, maybe I'll just put you on the spot here, if you don't mind. And sure. if, just hearing soul life balance, what what does that mean to you? Yeah, I love that. I love that term. Um, I, I think about what comes up for me is I can, what it's about really is bringing my soul into all aspects of my life, you know, into how I relate to my kids, how I relate to our business, my, you know, my relationship, just, you know, I mean, everything, my fitness is a big part of my life. I haven't really talked about that, but I'm, you know, I'm a competitive person and it's been integrating this kind of self-love and, and compassion into that. And not like, Oh, if I don't win, I'm worthless, you know, yeah, that, like kind of the old story of it. It's like, uh, I'm doing it because I love to challenge myself and, and I love digging deep and it, 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 it connects me to a, a, you know, another really special aspect of myself, that competitive side that can really just dig deep. And it's, I align that digging deep when I'm struggling and I'm like, am I going to choose to keep going down this fear rabbit hole or am I going to look towards love? look towards light. And it's like, I have those opportunities all the time in every part of my life. And so, yeah, man, living from my soul or from my, from my heart, seeing the world through the eyes of my soul, that's the mission right now. <laughs> you oh, know? I love it, brother. Thank you so much for sharing that. And you're totally embodying it right now. So um, it's amazing. Keep it up. It's an honor to know you, brother. And I'm um, looking forward to continuing the friendship, being more of your gang and everything. And um, keep uh, keep spreading this message of love. Absolutely, love. my brother. Yeah, such a pleasure. Cool. Well, thank you, Rick, for taking the time. Um, guys, make sure to connect with Rick. I'll put his uh, Instagram link in the show notes. And yeah, thanks so much. Thanks, brother. Thanks.